Occupational English test. Sample test one. Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. In this part of the test, you will hear Dr. Jean Matthews interviewing Michael Fraser, a patient with a recent problem. Good morning, Michael. Um, come on in and take a seat. Um, my name is Jean Matthews. Well, hello, Doctor. Well, uh, can you tell me what's brought you here today? Well, to be honest, I haven't been feeling well for the past week or so. That's no good. What sort of symptoms have you had? I've had a fever for a few days. It uh, comes on worse in the afternoons as well. Mm -hmm. I have been feeling a bit nauseous as well. And are you taking anything for that? Uh, Panadol, things like that? No, I haven't. I've just been trying to tough it out. Okay. And what about your eating habits? Um, have you noticed any change to your appetite? Yeah, well, I don't seem to be as hungry. I haven't been able to complete my meals without feeling a bit sick. Mm. And uh, with the nausea, has it ended up in vomiting? Yeah, I did vomit actually, both yesterday morning and this morning. That's one of the reasons I thought I'd better come and see you. Okay. And what about any other aches or pains generally? I'm feeling a bit, little bit tired and I've had a few pains in my joints and uh, I've been a little bit stiff in the mornings. Mm. And have you noticed any, any other sort of changes um, such as yellowish skin or in the whites of your eyes? Well, I didn't, but my wife commented this morning that uh, mm. she thought um, my skin had turned a bit yellowish. Mm. And what about the colour of your urine? Um, any changes there? Well, now you mention it, I, I do think it's become darker in colour. Mm. Okay, let's see. Now, Michael, I'd just like to get some background details before we go any further. Um, could we start, just start with your age, please? I'm 38. Are you married? Yes, I am. And any children? Yeah, I've got two children. And how old are they? I've got a daughter who's nine and a son who's eleven. Oh, lovely. Okay. And what about your employment? Um, what sort of work do you do? I'm a carpenter by trade. I see. And uh, you work mainly on building sites and places like that? Well, I do work on building sites, but the company I'm currently working for now has quite a few overseas projects, so I do go overseas quite a bit with my work. Mm. And whereabouts have you worked recently? Well, this year I've been to East Timor, and I've just come back from New Guinea about uh, 10 days ago. Mm, I see, okay. And uh, just tell me a little bit more about your general health. Well, pretty fine, I think. I eat healthily, and I haven't had any complaints. And uh, do you smoke at all? I do smoke, but I try to keep it under control. I suppose I smoke about 10 cigarettes a day. Mm, okay. And uh, what about alcohol? Well, I have a couple of beers most days, but my wife and I are trying to be responsible and have a couple of alcohol three days each week. Mm, well, that's an excellent idea. Okay. Very good. And now, just to go on to your family history, um, what about your parents? Are they in good health? Yeah, they're both in quite good health. Um, my father, he retired a couple of years ago, but he's fine. And my mother, she's well, 
She does have high blood pressure and she does take some medication for that, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I've got three sisters and they're all well. Okay, good. Well, Michael, your blood pressure is certainly excellent and um, you're not overweight. Oh, I'm pleased to hear that. Mm, but what I do think, based on your symptoms um, and the jaundice and everything you've told me, I'm a little concerned that you might have hepatitis A. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is not something to be greatly alarmed about, but it may be connected with your overseas travel. It's spread through fecal oral transmission, and it may be that you've, you've touched something or, and that's been contaminated, for example. So, you think I might have picked this up on one of my overseas trips then? Mm, so yes, it's very possible. Um, when you travel, do you eat the local foods? Well, actually, because I do travel a lot, I am aware of the risks and I'm very careful with what I eat. I try to only eat food from the hotel and on this particular trip, I didn't eat out in the marketplace mm -hmm. and I always drank bottled water. Okay. Well, look, I'm sure you did take proper precautions, but um, even when we do this, it's still quite possible, you know, sometimes um, the hotel staff may not have practiced the, the level of hygiene required. Um, they might have touched utensils or food that you've eaten, and that's how this can be picked up. So, oh, I see. Well, this is a real nuisance for me, Doctor. If I've got this hepatitis, what can I expect to happen now? Well, uh, the first thing we need to do is confirm this diagnosis, and for that you'll need to take a liver function test. I see. Boy, age 10. Now take notes on the case history and current symptoms. So your GP suggested you bring Tony in? Yes, we've had a very bad night. He's had hardly any sleep, wheezing, out of breath and coughing. I was really worried, so I rang up Dr Cooper. Does he use a blue inhaler? Yes, he's had one for years. But it didn't help? Not this time. Is his asthma normally under control? Well, he's had it since he was four. I was worried about him going to school at the start, but he seems to manage most of the time. Have you any animals at home? No, he wanted a pet, so we got him a cat, but it made his condition worse, so he had to give it away. Have you noticed if he's allergic to anything else? Well, we try to keep dust down in the house. Who did you see about Tony's asthma in the first place? We were sent to St Mary's and he had lots of tests to see what he was allergic to. And what were the results? Oh, uh, he was allergic to lots of things. So he was put on Intel, was he? Yes, he took that for years regularly. But a year ago, his asthma got worse and our GP changed inhalers. Does he now use a brown inhaler? Yes, he uses it regularly. Is there anyone else in the family with hay fever, eczema or asthma? Oh yes, my mother had asthma all her life. I had eczema as a child. On my husband's side, several people have hay fever. Has Tony had any illness apart from asthma? No, fortunately not. That's enough. Has he ever had to come into hospital before with a similar attack to today's? Yes, they put him on steroid tablets. Another time, he was rushed into intensive care and put on a machine to help him breathe. Has he a nebulising machine at home? Yes, and a peak flow meter. The asthma nurse showed us how to use it. What is Tony's usual peak flow rate? 300. And what was it today? 100. He's been very restless all night and breathless. He took more and more puffs, but he's just the same. Does anything special bring on one of these attacks? It seems to be when he gets a cold. Hmm, that's very common. Well, Tony, I'm going to bring you into hospital to get you sorted out, all right? Thank you, Doctor. That's a relief.
In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. In this part of the test you will hear a nurse, explaining about spillage management. Spillage on fabric or carpet surface e.g. sphygmo in the clinic. Put on the gloves, dispose of, wrapped, I.K. remove any glass as broken glass. Using the scoop, push the globules of mercury together so that they form large globules which can be collected using the syringe. Transfer the waste mercury to the waste container. When only the small globules of mercury remain, take the alloy wool and pull off piece about 2.5 cm in diameter. Using the alloy wool like cat and wool bud, dab it onto the remaining mercury. Allow the wool to remain in contact with the mercury. Do not press hard or you may force the mercury into the pile of the fabric. You will see the mercury filling the gaps between the metal strands as it forms an amalgam. The alloy wool bud will hold the mercury. When it docks not pick up anymore and the mercury drops out again, use another piece of alloy wool. Place the contaminated wool in the waste container. Cap the waste container tightly and return it to the spillage kit. Now you will hear a talk about venous catheter care. To prevent infection, anything that touches the exit site of the CVC and anything that goes into the CVC must be sterile. Your nurse will show you how to care for the CVC properly. The following guidelines are helpful in preventing infection. Do not let the CVC exit site get wet until it is well healed. You may shower 72 hours after the catheter has been inserted. When you bath or shower, you must cover the site with waterproof material, such as household plastic wrap, taped over the dressing and injection caps. Do not submerge the CVC site or caps below the level of water in a bathtub, hot tub, or swimming pool. Store CVC supplies in a clean, dry place such as a shelf in a closet or a drawer. Always clean your work area with alcohol and let it to dry completely before setting up your supplies. Or you can cover the area with clean paper towels. Use only sterile supplies. Open all packages carefully without touching the contents. Handle dressings only at the edges. Never touch the open end of the CVC when the cap has been removed. Never touch the end of the needle less cannula or the end of the open syringe. If this happens accidentally, use a new cannula or syringe. Never use scissors, pins, or sharp objects near the CVC or other tubing. The catheter could be damaged easily. If your catheter has a clamp, keep it clamped when not in use. Some CVCs show where the clamp must be placed. If your CVC does not show the clamp location, ask your nurse to show you where to clamp. Remember to wash your hands thoroughly before and after working with the CVC. Now you will hear about drainage procedure of leg bag. A leg bag is a urine collection bag that is trapped to your leg. It is smaller than the bag that you may use at night. This smaller bag allows you to move around more easily. However, you must empty the leg bag every 3 to 4 hours. 
To drain the bag, follow these steps. Wash your hands with soap and water. Unfasten the lower leg strap. Remove the cap and open the clamp. Do not touch the drain port with your fingers or allow it to touch the urine measuring container or toilet seat. If you are supposed to measure the urine, drain it into a container that is being used only for this purpose. Measure the amount of urine, record it, then empty the urine into the toilet. If you do not need to measure, simply drain the urine into the toilet. After the urine has drained completely, wipe the drain port and the cap with a cotton ball or gauze soaked with an antiseptic solution such as rubbing alcohol or povidine iodine, such as betadine. Close the clamp and fasten the lower leg strap. Wash your hands with soap and water. Now you will hear a talk about IABP therapy. IABP therapy is used to treat cardiogenic shock. That's when your heart can't pump enough blood to meet the needs of your body. Some heart problems can cause cardiogenic shock. These include Unstable angina Heart attack Certain abnormal heart rhythms Heart failure Heart defects You may also need an IABP if you have a certain medical procedure. For example, you may need it if you have a percutaneous coronary intervention. This procedure opens a blocked artery in the heart. You also might benefit from an IABP if you have heart surgery. In some cases, you might not be able to use an IABP, even if your heart can't pump enough blood. For example, People with a leaky aortic valve can't safely use an IABP. Those with aortic aneurysms also can't benefit from the therapy. Now you will hear about postoperative complications. The causes of vomiting after surgery are many and can be best determined by establishing the relationship between onset of vomiting and the time of the operation. The two most common causes of postoperative vomiting are drug-induced and gut atony. Vomiting that occurs in the immediate postoperative period is usually drug-related. If it is due to the effects of anesthesia, vomiting will usually settle within 24 hours. Current anesthetic techniques and modern antiemetics have rendered nausea and vomiting a relatively minor post-operative problem for most patients. Vomiting that occurs several days after operation may still be drug-related, but in this instance is usually due to an opiate rather than an anesthetic agent. Vomiting may be secondary to gut stasis, and this atony is usually self-limiting. If prolonged, a prokinetic agent can be effective. If vomiting starts seven days or so after abdominal surgery, a mechanical cause for the problem should be considered. Now you will hear about ABG sample collection. Palpate the radial artery with your non-dominant hand's index finger around 1 cm proximal to the planned puncture site, avoiding directly touching the planned puncture site that you have just cleaned. Warn the patient you are going to insert the needle. Holding the ABG syringe like a dart insert the ABG needle through the skin at an angle of 45 degrees over the point of maximal radial artery pulsation which you identified during palpation. Advance the needle into the radial artery until you observe blood flash back into the ABG syringe. The syringe should then begin to self-fill in a pulsatile manner. Do not pull back the syringe plunger. Once the required amount of blood has been collected remove the needle and apply immediate firm pressure over the puncture site with some gauze. Engage the needle safety guard. Remove the ABG needle from the syringe and discard safely into a sharps bin. Place a cap onto the ABG syringe and label the sample. Yourself or a colleague should continue to apply firm pressure for 3 to 5 minutes to reduce the risk of hematoma formation.
Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best, according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. In this part of the test, you will hear a talk based on an essay published by the Public Library of Open Science on the topic of global affordability of fluoride toothpaste. The cariogenic potential of diet emerges in areas where fluoride supplementation is inadequate, such as in many developing regions and countries of the world. There's no doubt that Dental caries is a global health problem and has a significant negative impact on the quality of life, economic productivity, adult and children's general health and development. What is worse, untreated dental caries in preschool children is associated with poorer quality of life due to the discomfort and difficulties in ingesting food. And this can result in a failure to gain weight and impaired cognitive development. This situation can be very distressing for families and regrettably, since low-income countries do not have sufficient funds to afford dental restorative treatment, combined with the fact that they are most vulnerable to the impact of illness, then it's fair to say that they should be afforded a greater degree of protection. By World Health Organization estimates, one third of the world's population have inadequate access to needed medicines, not because of education levels or location, but because they cannot afford them. Despite the inclusion of sodium fluoride in the WHO's essential medicines model list, the global availability and accessibility of fluoride for the prevention of dental caries remains a global problem. Now, the optimal use of fluoride is an essential and basic public health strategy in the prevention and control of dental caries because dental caries is the most common non-communicable disease on the planet today. Although a whole range of fluoride vehicles are available for fluoride use, such as drinking water, salt, milk, varnish, to name a few, the most widely used method for maintaining a constant low level of fluoride in the oral environment is fluoride toothpaste. Equity pricing is another method of reducing costs. It's based on the principle that the poor should pay less for effective medication and have better access to effective medication. The price of fluoride toothpaste should be fair, equitable and affordable, even for poor communities. Moreover, the same brand of toothpaste should be available at different prices in different countries in accordance with the people's wages and purchasing power. Expensive ingredients and packaging is another area where costs can be reduced. Approximately 40% of the cost of production of toothpaste is related to the enclosing or protecting the toothpaste for distribution, sale and use. Another 35% is attributed to the ingredients, and the final 25% can be attributed to manual work involved in manufacturing the product. Extract two questions 37 to 42. In this part of the test you will hear a presentation by a consultant regarding Tourette syndrome. For questions 37 to 42, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes.
Tourette syndrome is a type of neurological disorder characterized by involuntary tics and repetitive vocalizations. Latest research indicates there may be as many as one in 200 people affected in Australia. It commonly affects people between the ages of 2 and 21 years, with the majority of cases occurring in children aged 4 to 12 years. More boys than girls are affected. Milder forms of Tourette syndrome can be misdiagnosed, as it often occurs at the same time as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and conduct disorder. This condition commonly appears first between the ages of 2 and 12 years. For some sufferers, there may be a lessening of symptoms in late adolescence. It is, however, a lifelong condition that is not degenerative. Most children with Tourette syndrome are able to exert temporary control over their tics and vocalizations, while others require a cocktail of medications. The cause is mysterious, but theories include bacterial infection, abnormalities in the metabolism of brain chemicals, and genetic factors. Since stress and emotional overexcitement seem to exacerbate the condition, learning relaxation techniques can help. Whether or not Tourette syndrome is linked to other disorders, such as attention deficit disorder or learning disabilities, like dyslexia, is still undergoing scientific debate. Sometimes the disorder can spontaneously resolve for unknown reasons. There is no cure. Symptoms The symptoms of Tourette syndrome can differ from one child to the next, but may include a variety of tics, such as eye blinking, shrugging and facial grimace. Milder forms of Tourette syndrome can be misdiagnosed, as it often occurs at the same time as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder and conduct disorders. At least one involuntary vocalization, such as grunting, sniffing or barking, that is repeated over and over. Attacks of tics and vocalizations, either daily or regularly. In some children, other behavioral or learning difficulties, such as dyslexia or obsessive compulsive behavior. Appears between the ages of 2 and 21 years. A waxing and waning of the symptoms over several weeks or months. Simple and complex. Tourette syndrome can be mild, moderate or severe. The intensity of symptoms can change within the individual, sometimes on a daily basis. Stress or tension tends to exacerbate the condition, while relaxation or concentration eases the symptoms. Sometimes the symptoms come and go over a period of months. There are two broad categories of Tourette syndrome. These are simple, a milder version which includes tics such as blinking, sniffing, shrugging and grimacing and vocalizations such as grunting and clearing the throat. Complex, a more severe version which includes jumping, spinning in circles and compulsively touching things, and vocalizations such as repeating words or sounds, echolalia, and swearing, coprolalia. Theories on what causes Tourette syndrome. The exact cause of Tourette syndrome remains a mystery, but research is focusing on a number of possibilities, including Genetic factors. Tourette syndrome seems to be an inherited condition. A child of a person with Tourette syndrome has a 50% chance of developing the condition themselves. Boys are three times more likely to inherit the condition than girls. Streptococcal infection. The Streptococcus bacterium can cause a wide range of infections, ranging from mild to severe and life-threatening. One theory proposes that a particular infection may be responsible for the neurological changes. Neurochemical abnormalities. The chemicals of the brain, neurotransmitters, seem to be metabolized differently in people with Tourette syndrome, especially the mood regulators, dopamine and serotonin. Other disorders. Researchers are divided on whether Tourette syndrome is associated with other disorders, such as attention deficit disorder, learning disorders, including dyslexia, and obsessive-compulsive behaviors, although they often appear together with Tourette syndrome.